The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Soon after healing the centurion's slave, Jesus went to a city called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up, began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The old saying has it that charity begins at home. You take care of your own people first. And so the widow of Zarephath, to whom the prophet Elijah was sent, seemed to believe. Charity begins at home. But sometimes old slogans like charity begins at home don't hold water for the Christian. Picture this woman, this widow, and her plight for a moment. In the ancient Near East, a woman's identity and role in society depended upon her relationship with the men in her life. First, her father, then maybe a husband, then perhaps a son or a brother. This widow in our story believes she is at the end of her rope. The larder is bare. And she and her son have only a little meal in a jar and oil in a jug. Jesus also encounters a widow and her son who had died in today's gospel lesson. You can see why the framers of the lectionary put these two stories about widows together. One site I consulted online said that there were some 76 references to widows throughout the Bible. Widows seem to be close to the heart of God because they are vulnerable. Now, do you notice any humor in the first story? Yes, I believe it's there. First of all, God tells Elijah to go to Zarephath, that he has commanded a widow there to feed him. Not the most robust form of provision. She probably wasn't a pillar of the town. She probably was not a member of the Zarephath Chamber of Commerce or the Junior League. Just get up and go. I've got this little widow all set to take care of you. Go, I'm preparing this for you. And obviously the widow had gotten some sort of message too. Notice how Elijah first tests the waters. Could I have a drink of water, he says. And as she was getting the water, he says, well, how about a little bread, too? And at that point, she gets her back up. And her hoarding instinct kicks in, and rightly so. And she rehearses some version of Charity Begins at Home. 
She tells Elijah, I'm just gathering these few sticks so that I can go home and prepare this handful of meal and this little bit of oil so that my son and I can eat it and die. So that we can eat it and die. We are at the end. The world is closing in. And you, you have the nerve the gall, the chutzpah, to ask me to give, to help you? Can't you just see her? And then Elijah delivers the message of the angels. He basically says, be not afraid. Breathe. Calm down. Center yourself. The Lord will provide if you will only cooperate. Open your hands. The jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. Remember the story of the children of Israel being given the manna in the wilderness as they were wandering in the desert, that mysterious substance that descended and fell upon the grass? and how they were to gather each day just enough for that day, except for the day before the Sabbath, when they could gather for two days. Otherwise, if they gathered more, if they started to give in to any hoarding instinct, it would rot. Similar theme to the instinct of hoarding in this gospel. Somehow, Elijah's message rang true to this widow, and she cooperated. She opened her heart and her hands, as well as her oil jug and her meal jar, and God provided enough to sustain them. The implication of this story is that if she had not shared, she and her son would have died in their hoarding, physically and spiritually. I believe this story speaks to a fundamental approach to life, do we live with hands clenched, arms crossed, safe, protected, impervious to threat, or with hands open and vulnerable? Throughout Scripture, it seems God and then God in Christ and then God the Holy Spirit is always trying to get people to open their clenched hands, to expand God's view their view of God's provision, to trust God's abundance, which is part of the abundant life. As the message was given to St. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Yet how difficult that is to do, and how easy it is, once the next challenge comes, to forget God's provision in the past, which is exactly what the widow does in the next part of the story. Her son becomes sick and dies, and she turns on Elijah. She basically accuses him of descending upon her, much like a plague. That's what we do. We worry, we fret, we hoard for ourselves. We think we have to make everything work ourselves. We forget how we've been provided for in the past, just as that widow did. You may have heard me reference before, and if you were at Shrinemont last week, you certainly did, the posture of prayer in the early church. It's the same posture the priest uses at the altar. It's called the Oran's position. It's hands open and raised. You can literally feel the difference in your body if you stand like this for a time, and then if you stand like this. As you stand with arms open and extended, you are vulnerable. You could get kicked in the gut. It would seem a key element of the spiritual life is engaging that openness, that vulnerability. The inescapable message of Scripture is that the ways in which we relate to our possessions or all of life cannot be left unexamined. Whether we are millionaires or whether we only have a little meal in a jar and some oil in a jug. Do we put our trust in our own savings, in the work of our hands, in what we have built? Is that where our security lies? 
If so, what do we do with that when the market falls 350 points in one day? Or when the value of the house falls by one third or more? This is the key spiritual aspect of stewardship, recognizing God's provision to and for us first and always, beginning with the gift of life itself and then giving back gratefully with open hands and hearts to God and to our brothers and sisters. That's also the basis of true community because community requires another kind of openness, that of our time. Increasingly, we feel the need to hoard our time, to carve it out and hold it close to the chest so that the needs of the broader community are more and more an afterthought. This is a key spiritual challenge for this parish and indeed for any parish in our day and time. Participation, ownership, showing up and giving is what we're called to do. The parish is a laboratory, an incubator for a different kind of life, a critique of the unexamined materialistic hoarding instinct that we all share and which is practiced freely out there. It's a key element of discipleship, a key element of becoming a follower of Jesus. I've done a lot of funerals, and I'm struck that when loved ones remember and talk about and celebrate those who have died at funerals, they speak of the ways of which he or she gave of themselves, the ways in which they were there for others, for the greater good, for the country, for the society, for the family, for the church, for those in need. I have yet to hear anyone say, he took care of himself first. Now that might be true, but I can tell you they don't lead with that. I don't know about you, but I notice a disturbing trend towards selfishness in this country. And what's really disturbing is when I feel it within myself. From drivers who will do anything to get one car length ahead, to the vicious tone of the current political debate. As all of this swirls around us, the Christian always needs to ask, what would Jesus do? After all, he is the one who said, as you have done it to the least of these, you have done it to me. I shared at the 8 o'clock Eucharist what I now share with you. As I was preparing this sermon, I had the strong feeling that it was meant for one or more people quite personally, quite directly. Maybe you feel some version of God saying to you, in effect, yeah, get going. I've set up a little widow to take care of you. Go ahead and retire. I will take care of you. Go ahead and leave this abusive relationship. I will take care of you. Go ahead and leave this substance or this behavior to which you're addicted. I will take care of you. Venture out to where I'm calling. I will take care of you. God seems to be saying to trust, to step out, that it will be okay. If that seems somehow to be your case, will you tell me about it at the door? I would like to know. And some did at eight. Christians, individually and corporately, always need to consider the plight of the poor and to be asking what we can do about it. Together we can do so much. In general, how, with God's help, can we make this world a better place? How can we help to build God's kingdom? Not just because it feels good or looks good, but because it is what we are commanded to do. So I ask you this week to think about that widow. And think about your own life this week, in your business dealings, in your relationship dealings, in your family dealings. 
as you perhaps deal with the insufferable neighbor or the exotic aunt? Will you and I approach the world this week with clenched hands, protected and walled off, or with open hands, trusting God's provision for the next step and beyond? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.